for in one hour is thy judgment come. Babylon falls quickly. Things can change very, very rapidly. See, if I end up running from the Lamb when He reappears, something has gone terribly wrong in my life. The Messiah not only has to fulfill all those Old Testament prophecies, not only does He have to die in the exact year that Daniel chapter 9 says, but He also has to accept the guilt of every human sin right before He dies and then die within that 24-hour period. I will pay the penalty and I will die that same day. God never forces the mind. So first Jesus prayed that those who follow him would be separated from the world based on what this book says right here. So God has his sign and the devil has his mark or his sign of authority. And it's up to us to decide which way we will go. We're going to go ahead and have a, a word of prayer as we begin our, our study tonight. So I'll invite you to bow your heads. Gracious Father, you've blessed us with another day of life. And it's with great gratitude that we come before you once again to open up the word of God and in the same process, open up our hearts and allow you to teach us, to instruct us, to change us and to transform us. So we pray for a special anointing on Tim Rumsey's lips, that he would speak the truth and, and speak it with love. Pray that you would, uh, yeah, just uh, give him an, an anointing of your spirit and uh, teach us through him. Thank you for the, the time and the energy and the, the study that he's put into these messages. And now may we be good receivers, good soil that we might bear fruit to eternal life. So thank you. A blessing over each of the hearers, I'll, I'll, remembering the blessing that you told us in the beginning of the book of Revelation that those that hear and those that do will be blessed. So we claim that promise, and we are uh, excited to begin this night together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening. Good evening. Wasn't it a beautiful day today? Yes. Still is, isn't it? It's good to be here. Thank you for coming. If you were not here last night, we, we looked at, uh, well, our topic was chaos, and we spent our time looking at some of the uh, chaos happening in the world today, and uh, we decided we didn't have to look very far, right? This world is uh, unraveling in all of its aspects, it seems. Tonight, we're going to look differently, and our topic for tonight is order, what the universe reveals about God. And we're going to start at the very beginning of the story in Genesis 1, verse 1. And we're going to look at this issue, which is a big issue in our world today, and that is where did we all come from? Are we here by chance? Is it just a product of enough time and the right circumstances, and then somehow we, we arrived here? Or is the Bible's explanation of origins something that has not only scientific validity, but intellectual honesty as well? It's a huge topic. There's no way we can even really start scratching the surface in the few minutes that we have, but we're going to do our best to look at some of the reasons that an intelligent faith in God is both reasonable uh, and can lead us to the truth. So we're going to start with the Bible's very first verse here. What is the first thing the Bible tells us about God? Now, the Bible's a big book. And I have a pretty big version of it here, right? You probably have a big version of the Bible as well. God could have began this book in many different ways, right? You think of all the things that God could reveal about himself, all the things that he could tell us about himself. What's the very first thing he says? You probably know this verse, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So of all the things that God could have chosen to tell us very first about himself, the most important thing that he knew to begin with is the fact that he is creator and that we are not here by accident. Now, the fact that you exist, you're not just a fluke of atoms and quarks and whatever, some plasma floating around the universe. The Bible says that you exist because you have a creator that loves you and wanted you, that chose for you to exist. And the fact that you're here tonight, the fact that Anything has happened today in your life is because God has, has given that gift to you. That's the picture that the Bible gives us. Now, the, the world, of course, has a very different story. 
And so we're going to, again, just look at a few of these issues tonight. By the way, this picture that you see on the screen, this is the Helix Nebula. It's um, astronomically speaking pretty close to Earth, only a few billion light years away. <clears throat> but it looks like an eyeball, doesn't it? And in fact, there's not the scientific name, um, but kind of the, the um, slang name of this is the Eye of God. And you can understand why. It looks like a giant eyeball looking at us here tonight. So, kind of interesting. Okay, another great Bible verse on this topic is Psalm 104, verse 2. God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. And this is actually a picture of the uh, Milky Way galaxy. Now, you have some beautiful skies here uh, in Montrose. And I imagine that sometimes, especially if you get a little ways out of town, it gets pretty dark, right? And you can really see those stars shining brightly. But uh, if I was a betting person, which I'm not, I would be willing to bet you've never seen the Milky Way look like that, right? Isn't that beautiful? A friend of mine took that picture in Africa uh, where there's no lights at all. And imagine looking up and seeing that kind of sky in the Milky Way. Uh, I think this is the kind of sky that Abraham saw when he looked up and God gave him that promise. Your descendants will be like the stars of the sky. Now, today we look up when we see maybe a couple of hundred, but this is what he saw. Now, when scientists talk about the observable universe, they are talking about everything that we can see through our most powerful telescopes, you know, from one end of the universe to the other. So I'm just going to th throw a few quick facts at you that uh, scientists tell us. The observable universe is about 93 billion light years across. Um, that's big, right? We don't even try to translate that into miles. That's a, obviously an immense expanse. There's over 100 billion galaxies that we can see, and uh, there are probably more that we can't see. And of course, each of those galaxies contains, you know, millions and millions and billions of stars. So the estimated total number of stars in the universe is over 300 sextillion stars. You probably haven't used that number recently, have you? That's a lot. The total mass of the universe. Now, I'm sure many of you stayed up last night worrying about how much the universe weighs. So now you get the answer. It's around 1 times 10 to the 53rd kilograms. So if you had a, a 10 with 53 zeros after it, that's the weight, scientific notation. <clears throat> and our last little fact here, the total number of estimated atoms in the universe is 1 times 10 to the 80th, so 10 with 80 zeros after it. And I'm sure you've been really worrying about that number as well, right? <clears throat> but I do want you to tuck that last number away on a shelf in your mind because we're going to come back to it before we're finished tonight. 1 times 10 to the 80th, estimated total number of atoms in the universe. And I'll be honest, I have no idea how these guys estimate this stuff, but that's what they tell us. Now, <clears throat> how many of you have heard the term uh, the anthropic principle or the anthropic universe? This is uh, a term that is used to refer to the fact that our universe, and especially our planet, is hospitable to life. And we think of all the ways that the universe could function or even does function in other areas. I mean, we know that there's no human beings living on any other planet in our solar system because only this planet is hospitable to life. So our Earth uh, operates under this anthropic principle, meaning it's, it's uh, suitable and even welcoming for life. And when we think about the universe on a grand scale, what are the chances that the laws of physics would work in the way that they do? You know. Things like gravity and some of these other forces that determine how physics works. All of this works together in such a way that life is actually possible and that it actually exists here on planet Earth. This is the anthropic principle. And so scientists and philosophers talk about this. And we want to, let me use this illustration to kind of illustrate uh, how unlikely it is when you think about all the ways that the universe could have ended up functioning. I want you to imagine that you have a long razor blade that's 100 feet long, okay? And maybe we started, we leaned it up against the, the top of the church here, and it slopes down this way. And you're standing at the top of this um, razor blade with a 10-pound bowling ball. 
and you balance that bowling ball on the razor blade and then you let it go. And wonder of wonders, it rolls all the way down 100 feet, balanced on that razor blade and never falls off to the left or the right. How likely is that to actually happen? Obviously, extremely unlikely, but it is mathematically, at least, within the realm of possibility, right? If you balanced it perfectly and there were no winds or factors or no piece of dust that would tilt it this way or that way, you could theoretically get that bowling ball to roll 100 feet down a knife edge. And maybe that's a silly way of uh, illustrating this anthropic principle. The very fact that life does exist is in a sense on this razor edge of possibility, probability. probability. And um, <clears throat> we're gonna spend just a few minutes tonight trying to illustrate this so we can understand just how precise this universe has been put together. There are, we are told, about 30 fundamental constants that operate together to dictate basically how our universe operates. Now, one of these is gravity, and we're all familiar with that. Some of the other constants are the nuclear force or electromagnetism and uh, a bunch of others that, honestly, I can't remember right now. But they say there's about 30 of them, and they all have to work together in exactly the right way. And if one of them gets tweaked, even a tiny, tiny bit, you know, a fraction of a percentage, then that bowling ball gets thrown off the, the razor uh, blade and life can't exist. So let's look at two of these to start with. The gravitational force, which of course is the attraction between two different bodies, and the electromagnetic force. And in terms of um, their interaction with each other, if you think of a star burning out in space, these two forces, uh, gravity and electromagnetism, they kind of work against each other, but they balance each other at the same time. And if gravity gets too strong, the star is going to collapse inside of itself. And if electromagnetism gets too strong, then the star is just going to expand and, and it kind of explode or you know, disappear in itself. And so the fact that you have stars that are stable, like our sun, that are just the right size to allow a planet like ours to circulate around it and to provide the right amount of warmth, but not too much warmth um, or too much cold, all of this is balanced by gravity and electromagnetism. So here's what we're told about these two forces. If we look at these two numbers, one, um, or putting in these numbers, one obtains 5.9 times 10 to the negative 39. So these are humongous numbers that we we're talking about for the gravitational force, and 2 times 10 to the negative 39 for the right-hand side, or the electromagnetic force. Nature has evidently picked the values of the fundamental constants in such a way that typical stars lie very close indeed to the boundary of convective instability. The fact that the two sides of the inequality are such enormous numbers and yet lie so close to one another is truly astonishing. So we're looking at mathematical probabilities here. What is the probability that gravity functions just the way it does and this electromagnetic force functions just the way it does? And the probability is almost zero, right, mathematically speaking. 10 with 39 zeros after it. One chance in that number. If gravity were very slightly weaker or electromagnetism very slightly stronger or the electron slightly less massive relative to the proton, all stars would be red dwarfs. A correspondingly tiny change the other way and they would all be blue giants. And our star is neither one of those, or our star, the sun, is neither one of those. So the fact that a star like our star exists only happens because these two forces are exactly tuned right where they have to be, and they balance each other out. It's pretty amazing. Now here's another constant. This is the cosmological constant, and it describes the energy density of empty space. You know, when astronomers look through their telescopes through space, you can see stars here and there, maybe a constellation there, but most of state, space appears to be empty, right? Uh, nothing out there. And so they use this cosmological constant to describe the empty space. If this constant were large and positive, the cosmological constant would act as a repulsive force that increases with distance, a force that would prevent matter from clumping together. So we wouldn't have constellations, we wouldn't have stars, we wouldn't have planets. If this force were large and negative, the cosmological constant would act as an attractive force increasing with distance 
a force that would almost immediately reverse the expansion of the universe and cause it to collapse. And this is being written by people that believe the Big Bang and you know, the universe is expanding like this. But the fact is this constant also is balanced, so to speak, on a knife edge. And it has to function exactly as it does for life to exist. Here's another constant, the conversion of hydrogen to helium. And this is one of the things that fuels uh, the burning of the stars. For the universe to exist as it does requires that hydrogen be converted to helium in a precise but comparatively stately manner, specifically in a way that converts seven one thousandths of its mass to energy. That's pretty precise, isn't it? Lower that value very slightly from 0.007% to 0.006%, and no transformation could take place. The universe would consist of hydrogen and nothing else, which means we wouldn't be here tonight. So there's a knife edge, right? Just tip, tip that bowling ball this much to the left or this much to the right, and life doesn't exist. Raise the value very slightly to 0.008%, and bonding would be so wildly prolific that the hydrogen would long since have been exhausted. In either case, with the slightest tweaking of the numbers, the universe as we know and need it would not be here. So as you start looking at these kinds of things in, in physics, these constants, you have to ask the question, what is the possibility that all of this would just happen by chance, right? If you were looking at just one constant, you could say, okay, that's amazing, it's incredible that it just happened to be that way. But you'd start lining these up, one, two, three, four, five, and you get to 30 of these things, and they're all functioning this way. That's a different question, isn't it? <clears throat> the strong force, another constant. The strong force holds together the subatomic particles and the nucleus of an atom. It cannot vary by more than 2% for proper formation of most elements in our periodic table. Again, very, very little room for variance on either side. So if, if we add all 30 of these constants together, here's a good summary statement. The odds of our anthropic universe arising amidst the total configurations possible for a creation event is so exceedingly, exceedingly, exceedingly remote that its notation in regular exponential form is one part in that number right there. Quick, count the zeros, right? That's a lot of zeros. This number is so large that if it were to be written out in ordinary notation, remember this is scientific notation, if we wrote it out in ordinary notation with every zero being, say, 10-point type, the number itself would fill up a large portion of the universe. You wouldn't have enough pencils and pens to write the number. That's amazing. So what does this tell us? This tells us how precise the Creator's aim must have been, namely to an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 123rd power. Now, how many atoms do they estimate are in the universe? Anybody remember that number? 10 to the 80th. That's a much, much smaller number than 10 to the 123rd. In other words, you would stand a much better chance of blindfolding yourself and taking a bow and arrow and shooting that arrow out into the middle of the universe somewhere and hitting one specific atom, one chance in 10 to the 80th. You would have a much better chance of doing that than of finding a universe like ours that functions and exists like it does. That's amazing, isn't it? Does this happen by chance, or does Genesis have something important to tell us about where we came from? Here's what Genesis says, Genesis 1 verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. In fact, seven times in the first chapter of the Bible, the Bible tells us that God looks at what he has made, and he says, it is good. It is good. And at the end, it is very good. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 says that his work is what? Perfect. God's work is perfect. He is the one that put this bowling ball on top of the knife edge, and he balances it, and it rolls all the way down. Let's look at another question. How careful was God in creating our earth, our planet, where we live? We know this is a special place, right? Because we've done a lot of looking throughout human history for life somewhere else. And so far, we've never found it, have we? We have found some other planets, and we're studying those carefully, but still no life anywhere else. 
So how careful was God in creating the earth? Job 26, verse 7 says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now, when you stretch something out and when you hang something up, these words imply that you're thinking about what you're doing, right? It's not like I'm tossing this remote onto the, the bench or the couch or something like that. The, the idea here is that God is doing this intentionally and he's doing it carefully. So what do we know about the earth where we live here? Well, first of all, the earth has the right orbit around our sun. Here's what we're told. Had earth been or had earth spun in an orbit only 5% closer to the sun, it would have experienced a runaway greenhouse effect, creating unbearable surface temperatures and evaporating the oceans. And had Earth been positioned just 1% further out, it would have experienced runaway glaciation, locking its surface water in ice for eternity. So in terms of our distance from the sun and the orbit that we take around the sun at any time of the year, we're always in exactly the right place, that sweet spot, so to speak. 1% further in, 5% further out. We're right there in that, they call it the, the habitable zone the distance from your star. And that just happens to be where we live. The Earth also has the right mass. Unless a planet reaches a certain mass, any surface air will gradually escape, right? There's not enough gravity to hold its atmosphere in, so all those gases would just dissipate. But if the planet grows too big, its internal, internal temperature will tend to convert surface water into vapor. Earth's mass turns out to be ideal for holding an atmosphere, yet preserving liquid water. And as we all know, our, our surface of our Earth is mostly water, isn't it? About 70% or so. And we also have this nice, thick, atmospheric layer, which makes life possible. And that is because the mass, the density of our Earth is just right. We also know that Earth has the right content uh, it's made of the right stuff for a protective magnetic field. You know, if we didn't have the magnetic field that we have, Earth would be bombarded by all kinds of solar radiation, and again, we wouldn't be here. So <clears throat> we have enough metals to form partially liquid iron and nickel. That's what creates the magnetic core. And then there's enough radioactive materials and processes going on deep inside the Earth to create this dynamo that creates the magnetic field. Again, precisely tuned just for the size of our Earth. Earth also has the right surface relief. Now this one I find very fascinating. The oceans contain enough water to cover a spherical Earth to a depth of about 4,000 meters, if we could spread those oceans out evenly over the entire surface of the Earth. So that's a deep ocean, right? 4,000 meters. If the surface of the planet varied only a few kilometers in elevation, Earth would be devoid of land. Thus, the planet's remarkable mixture of land and oceans is a balancing act. So this is a very fascinating observation again, especially when we remember that the present uh, surface of the Earth is not the, the way God made it originally at creation. The flood reshaped and reformed the surface of the Earth, and yet even in that great destruction, we see that God's hand was over the, the final product of the surface of the earth so that life could continue to be possible. So what conclusions can we reach as we uh, look at these things regarding our planet? Rather than being one planet among billions, earth now appears to be the uncommon earth. The data imply that earth may be the only planet in the right place at the right time. All right, next question. What does the Bible say about the creation of human beings? We're going to change our, or to shift our focus now um, to ourselves for a few minutes. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Obviously, we're only going to be able to touch on just a few things very briefly as we look at uh, some of the wonders that take place inside of us each and every day. But let's start with this interesting observation. We are each made up of between 10 to the 28 and 10 to the 29 atoms. This human scale is, in a numerical sense, poised midway between the masses of atoms and stars. It would take roughly as many human bodies to make up the mass of the sun as there are atoms in each of us. We straddle the cosmos and the micro world. As human beings, we are 
size-wise about halfway between the stars and halfway between the atoms. That makes it really relatively easy for us to both explore what's out there or to use our microscopes to explore the tiniest things in the universe. If you approach that from a biblical perspective, you can say, God must have created us just the right size so that we would have the best opportunity possible to explore his creation. We can create telescopes to look out there. We can create microscopes to look you know, at the small stuff. So very interesting in regards to the size of our bodies. Each of us has, rough, or an adult, has roughly 50 trillion cells in your body. Uh, and here's a little illustration of the cell. Now, back in the mid-1800s when Darwin first came out with this idea of the evolutionary process, our understanding of you know, cells and biology was obviously much different than it is today, much more simple than it is today. And so, as you know, the evolutionary theory suggests that life started as a single cellular organism and then gradually grew bigger and bigger and more complex, and then here we are today. What we know now is that even a single cell is an incredibly complex piece of machinery, and uh, it is not a simple structure. There is, it's like a factory or multiple factories within the cell all working together, and it is constantly churning out enzymes and proteins and, and dealing with waste and pushing the waste out and bringing nutrients in through its walls. And then, of course, in the middle, you have the nucleus where the DNA itself is found, and that DNA is replicating and duplicating and splitting and reversing itself, and all of this happens 24-7, nonstop, as, as your body does all of its functions. Um, there are, we are told, about 200,000 types of proteins in our cells. Now, that's a lot of proteins, isn't it? And um, these proteins really fuel all the functions of our body. The odds against the random creation of just one of those proteins, just one out of the 200,000 proteins, the odds of some random process creating one protein is about the same as you being blindfolded and randomly playing with a Rubik's Cube and having any single turn of that Rubik's Cube solve the Rubik's Cube, right? So one color on each side. So what are those odds? <clears throat> well, here's the Rubik's Cube which by the way, I've tried, without a blindfold, I have no chance of solving this, right? <laughs> if any of you know how, please let me know the secret. My boys are working on, on learning how to do that. But here's the odds, mathematically speaking, of any random turn of the Rubik's Cube uh, solving it. It's one in that number right there. That's 50 septillion. That's a big number, isn't it? And that's just one protein. You would have to multiply that by 200,000 to see the odds of all 200,000 proteins in our body arising by chance. This defies the imagination, doesn't it? And at this point, you have to say, mathematically, and in terms of probability, we are at zero, right? It just, there is no chance of this happening, even mathematically. So we have to be open to some other kind of explanation as to why we have all these proteins that function the way they do. Okay, we also have enzymes. Now, enzymes are specialized proteins that you know, make the processes of your body work the way they do. So digestion uses pro or enzymes in your stomach. Um, as muscles grow, those are enzymes in your stomach. As your liver gets rid of toxins in your body, enzymes fuel all of these processes that happen. There are about 2,000 enzymes in the human body. And the odds of finding all 2,000 of these enzymes in the perfect order that they exist is 1 in 10 to the 40,000. Okay, so 10 with 40,000 zeros after it. Now, how many atoms are there in the universe? Again, roughly 10 to the 80th. So you would be 500 times more likely to blindfold yourself and shoot that arrow and hit the exact atom somewhere in the universe that you're aiming for than you would to have all 2,000 enzymes just arise by chance. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? This, we're talking about not a 100-foot razor blade. Now we're talking about a razor blade hundreds of miles long, and that bowling ball has to stay on top as it rolls down. 
Let's talk for just a moment about DNA. Little illustration there. You know what DNA is, deoxyribonucleic acid, right? This is the genetic code of life. And um, incredibly thin, but also very, very long molecule that is coiled up inside every single one of your cells. And uh, there are four different bases that have to combine in just the right way. And those contain the information of life for everything that lives, whether it's a plant or whether it's an animal. The DNA determines what you look like, how tall you are, uh, all of our features, and that's true for every single living organism. Um, <clears throat> DNA is the most efficient means of storing information in the universe that we know of, short of the mind of God, right? Interesting uh, quote here, the capacity of DNA to store information vastly exceeds that of any other known system. It is so efficient that all the information needed to specify an organism as complex as man weighs less than a few thousand millionths of a gram. The information necessary to specify the design of all the species of organisms which have ever existed on the planet, a number estimated to be 1,000 million, could be held in a teaspoon, and there would still be room left for all the information in every book that's ever been written. So we think we're, we're hot stuff with our little flash drives, right? That hold several gigabytes. This is far more efficient. And every minute of every day, this, these DNA molecules in the middle of your cells are replicating themselves as your cells divide and grow. And I forgot to tell the, the guys running our sound system back here, I have a short video clip. I don't know if the, the sound is gonna pick up or not, but we'll at least watch the video here. A little illustration of uh, DNA replication. Yeah, and I'm hearing it right here. But she's explaining how this um, replication takes place. You were looking at an assembly line of amazing miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA that are humans and cranking out a copy of the story. This blue piece that the DNA is going into spins faster than a jet engine <coughs> and splits the DNA into two parts. So it gets divided into two strands. One strand is copied continuously. That's going out to the right. The other strand gets copied in reverse. And if I had paid more attention in biology class, I could explain to you better how that process works. So I apologize for that. But I think you get the point, right? This is an incredibly complex procedure of, it's not just that a cell splits, right? In order for all of that genetic information to be transferred, it has to first be copied in reverse. And if I remember correctly, it then goes to RNA, and then your cells will take the RNA, and as it uh, deals with the RNA, it creates the new DNA molecule and it reverses it again. So it's the same as the original copy. It's an amazing process. Uh, one last thing here on DNA. If we were to compare DNA to computer code, <clears throat> in some respects they are similar to each other because as you know, a computer code tells the computer what it's going to do and how it's going to function. DNA does much the same for the organism that you know it's part of. But this is, this is pretty amazing here. There are four levels of complexity or four dimensions in which DNA functions. And the first one is relatively self-explanatory or simple. Think of a computer program. It's just line after line, right? And so theoretically, if you took out the returns uh, or the hard breaks at the end of each line of, in a computer program, you would have one long line of code like this. And that's no problem for the computer. It can process through that in a second, and then it, it does its program. In a sense, this is what DNA is like. You can unravel this DNA and you can stretch it out like this and you have one long line of code. And if you have that helicase spinning as fast as a jet engine, it'll suck it right through and you get your processing done like this. But this is where things start to differ 
from what we as humans have created with computer codes. DNA also has the ability to rewrite or correct itself at different places in the code. It's almost self-correcting when it needs to be. And so it can adjust a section of the code as needed. Now, <clears throat> maybe we're approaching that with some of our artificial intelligence, uh, which I also have no idea how that works, right? But um, most computer programs cannot do this. They are programmed a certain way, and if there is an error in the programming, then the program is gonna have a malfunction. But DNA has this ability to rewrite and modify itself as necessary. But it doesn't stop there. DNA also has a three-dimensional aspect because it's not strung out like this, right? It's all wadded up into a ball like this. And so as it folds itself in on itself, the shape of the DNA actually determines which part is expressed. So if you imagine you took that DNA and you wound it up into the ball, the part of the DNA that is exposed to the exterior is the part that can be grabbed during these different processes and the, that genetic information is used. So that's pretty impressive, right? Computer programs can't do this. They can only go from top to bottom. But DNA has a three-dimensional aspect. It goes one step further because DNA doesn't have to stay coiled up in any specific shape. It can uncoil and then it can recoil in a different shape. And my understanding is that this is pretty new understanding that we're just starting to understand with, with how DNA functions. Depending on what gene needs to be expressed at a given time, the DNA will actually reshape itself so that that gene is the one that's exposed. And then once that information has been pulled, it will morph and reshape itself to expose another section that's needed at just the right time. So there's a time dimension as well. This is incredible. The most efficient information storage and transmission system that has, you know, that exists anywhere that we know of. God says in Isaiah 28, verse 1, come now and let us reason together, right? God wants us to exercise faith, but he also expects us to use our minds that he has given us. And he wants us to have a reasonable faith, a faith that is based on intelligence. And as we learn more and more about the universe, and the Bible is clear that God wants us to allow these things that we discover, where it's, whether it's out in the universe or what's happening inside of our bodies, he wants us to allow these things to draw us to him and to realize we were created. We are not here by accident. Um, my life is not an accident. Your life is not an accident. You're here on purpose because you have a creator that loves you and has a plan for your life. And the world is screaming a different story, isn't it? The world is doing everything it can to separate us from this kind of truth and from this faith in a loving creator. And uh, we can see the results. <clears throat> uh, people are filled with discouragement, despair, hopelessness. And as life happens to people, if you don't have something to hang on to, then uh, it's just blackness. And we're seeing this more and more clearly as we move forward in time. So we need to understand this. This is why God begins the Bible the way he does in Genesis 1 verse 1, by reminding us and revealing to us that life is not an accident, that it was created. Last verse here, Romans 1 verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God wants the things that we can see and understand in creation to lead us to a faith in a God that we can't see right now. And he promises that if we grow and we exercise that faith, someday we will see God with our eyes. We'll see our Savior face to face. Okay, question number one says, some of my Christian friends have no problem believing in evolution. However, it seems to me that evolution is not compatible with the gospel. Can you give any advice on how to respond to this idea? Now, how many of you have ever found yourself in a conversation like this? <laughs> and um, I found myself in those conversations, and I usually end up wishing I had better answers when it was over. Um, 
it might be helpful for us to think about some of the um, basic things that in the evolutionary worldview create life. Adaptation to the environment, right? The idea that whatever organism has adapted to its environment the best or the most efficiently is the one that's going to survive the best. You know, the moth that matches the tree on which it sits is less likely to be eaten, right? And so you would want to be able to adapt your coloring to that tree. That's one of the principles in the evolutionary worldview that creates life. Another principle is survival of the fittest, right? Um, if you're stronger, if you're faster, if you're smarter than the person next to you, then you're not going to get eaten, they're going to get eaten. That's another basic fundamental idea connected with the evolutionary worldview. Then you also have things like uh, beneficial mutations, right? Uh, the whole idea of Darwinian evolution is built on the supposition that that DNA replication that we saw is not happening exactly. In fact, there are changes or mutations, and they're beneficial. And um, that's a problem because every single mutation that we've ever observed, whether in the laboratory or out in the real world, is always destructive. Any kind of change results in birth defects or things like this. Then there's chance and there's time. It's interesting, if we take these five things, adaptation to the environment, survival of the fittest, beneficial mutations, uh, chance, and then the need for billions of years. If we take these ideas and move them into the spiritual realm, they don't work very well. What does the Bible tell us as Christians? Are we supposed to adapt to our environment? Or are we told to be not conformed to the pattern of this world? Now, Romans 12, verse 2 says, be not conformed. So if the world is doing this, that's a pretty good indication you probably shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing something different. So this is a completely opposite, 180 degree, different way of viewing life. What about survival of the fittest, right? Pastor studies longer, the Bible longer than me, or he's had more training than me. Therefore, he deserves salvation more than I do, right? No, okay, thank you for saying no. <laughs> is salvation limited to the fastest or the strongest or the most intelligent or the most whatever? No, Jesus says, everyone, come unto me and buy of me freely, right? It's one of the last verses in the Bible in Revelation chapter 22 is this beautiful invitation for everybody to come and to accept the gift of life freely from Jesus. So that doesn't fit either. We could go down the list. Um, beneficial mutations. You know, we have a genetic code, so to speak. It's called the Bible. And even more specifically, it's the law of God, the Ten Commandments. This is the genetic code for what it means to be a Christian, uh, a believer in God. If we start tinkering or messing with this genetic code that God has given to us, spiritually speaking, we're going to run into problems just like we do in the physical realm. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 5, uh, verse 19, he said, Think not that I come to change the law of the prophets or to get rid of them. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it and to magnify it. So he, he, Jesus is not in the business of changing the Word of God. We shouldn't be either. Um, chance. Think of Joshua when the Israelites were entering into Israel. He said, choose you this day whom you will serve, right? Don't leave it up to chance. Make a choice now what you're going to do, what your life is going to be about. Um, and then time. You know, evolution requires vast amounts of time, billions of years, and other, uh, to give enough time for these probabilities to happen, as we've seen tonight. Even with 13 billion years, whatever they say that the universe has existed, if you're looking at probabilities, there's zero probability, even in that amount of time, for these things to happen. But what are we told? Is it safe to delay a choice to give my life to Jesus, or does the Bible say make that choice today? Make the choice now, right? Don't delay. Make this choice now. So we see in all these areas, there is... A, a diametrically opposed worldview. We can't combine the two. All right, well said. Uh, another question here we had is, in Genesis 1-1, what is your understanding of what God created? This earth only? Our galaxy only? Everything visible throughout the web telescope? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. 
You know, you go through creation week and you reach day four and it says that God made the sun and the moon and the stars. And so presumably that includes everything that we can observe. Um, how he did that, you know, the Bible doesn't go into all the scientific nitty gritty into the process that he used. It simply says that he spoke and there it was. When we speak, we can describe what's already there. There's a camera there, there's a screen there, there's a light there. When God speaks, reality, you know, his words create reality. And there's a spiritual lesson there as well. When we read the words of the Bible, God wants us to realize that these promises that he gives to us can create reality, spiritual realities in our life. And that's one of the big lessons from Creation Week in a spiritual realm, is the same God that created the physical world in seven days or six days can create new realities in your life and my life instantly, right? We don't have to wait 13 billion years to overcome temptation. Uh, we can claim Christ's power now, and he can give us that strength. Could God have used the process of evolution to create life? Now, this is a big idea that's out there, isn't it? Uh, it's often called theistic evolution. This attempt to smash these two worldviews together, right? <clears throat> We've kind of already touched on this. The evolutionary worldview requires death in order for new forms of life to, to, to evolve and emerge. And you look back, if in fact there had been millions or even billions of years of gradual development, think of all of the organisms and forms of life that have had to die in order for us to be here today. So if you try to combine these two things together and say that God, yes, God created, but he used the process of evolution to create, what you're really saying is that God, number one, can't create instantly. And number two, God has used death to create life. And that creates big problems theologically. Because according to the Bible, death comes as a result of sin. Death was not part of God's original plan for this world. And in fact, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that at the second coming, and with the events connected with that, God will eventually get rid of death. It's the last enemy, right? Um, and so the whole idea that we get from the Bible is that God, death is the enemy. God has never used death in his purposes. It's something that he has allowed for a time being in this battle between good and evil. And we'll get into some of those reasons that he's done that in a few nights. Amen. All right. Is it a question that says, what is the connection of this topic to Revelation unfolding? Take your Bible. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. That's a good, good question. Revelation chapter 14. And we will hit this chapter uh, later in the series more than once. Let me just say this. The book of Revelation is not a chronological book like a history book in the Bible. Um, to really understand the message of Revelation, you have to realize that it is constructed more like a mountaintop. And you understand that because you live near mountains. <laughs> it reflects itself. And the most important part of Revelation is in the middle of the book, at the peak of this mountaintop. We call it chiastic structure. And so the middle of Revelation, this mountaintop, so to speak, is chapters 12, 13, and 14. And really, the rest of the book is there to help us understand the message in these chapters. Now, we'll deal with that later, but for right now, go to Revelation chapter 14, and I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So here's the point. At the very middle of the book of Revelation, in its most important part, the most important messages for us to understand, there is this call that God makes for people to worship him as creator. And we'll dive into that more deeply in future nights and see the reason for that. But uh, this is a call back to Genesis 1 verse 1. And don't forget that you are not here by accident. Amen. Yeah, fantastic. 
Uh, wow, we were able to answer all of your questions and we still have a couple of minutes to spare. I'll just add to that. I think, I think it is really interesting. When you study deeply into the book of Revelation, you'll notice that two thirds of that book are, are drawing on imagery, uh, stories, uh, things that you will find in, in other parts of scripture. Uh, there's really no way to treat the book of Revelation as it should uh, with, with the respect and, and uh, import that it, it, it has, unless you study the other 65 books of the Bible. Uh, particularly the Old Testament, and as uh, Tim Rumsey is going to be digging into the book of Daniel uh, a fair amount through this, that really, uh, yeah, to, to do it justice, you need to understand it in the context of, of the rest of Scripture. So that was a, a fantastic question that's asked, because sometimes the topics are going to seem like they're outside of the, the purview of, of, of the book of Revelation, but it's actually laying the foundation, the groundwork, in order to be able to do justice to the topics we'll be, we'll be addressing in, in the book of Revelation. I think we might have time for me to address one question that was handed to me after the meeting last night. And um, the question, I don't remember exactly, but the, the idea of the question was this. How do you decode the symbols in Revelation? I mentioned last night that Revelation is written or encoded in symbols. So the question is, well, how do you know how to decode the symbols? And the answer is that the Bible decodes itself. Um, Isaiah chapter 28 tells us line upon line and precept upon precept. So if you want to understand one passage of the Bible and it's not clear from that immediate passage, then you got to start digging and looking. And somewhere else in the Bible, it will show you. I think we've got time to just illustrate that briefly. Uh, take your Bible and let's go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to see in this verse one of the symbols that recurs a lot, not only in Revelation, but in the book of Daniel as well. So this is Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. And John is writing, he says, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So in this verse, you have a symbol. The symbol is water, but the angel that is speaking to John or giving this vision to John explains immediately what the symbol represents. It represents, the water represents people and not just a small group of people, right? It's nations and languages and tongues. We're talking about multitudes, uh, masses of people. Now, that's really handy when you find in the same verse the explanation of what the, the symbol means. And this happens more than once. There are passages in Daniel where an angel is speaking to Daniel, and the angel says, the ram represents the kingdom of Medo-Persia, and the goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And you can almost hear Daniel saying, well, thank you. That makes it very simple, right? There's other times where you have to connect verses of the Bible together. And... That takes a little more time, but the best way to do that is to get a good concordance. And now you can find them online. Um, I, I use blueletterbible.org a lot. There's lots of others as well, Bible Gateway. Um, and you can just type the word in. You could type in water, and it'll spit right out to you all the times in the Bible that the word water is used. And yes, you do have to sort through those, but Spending time in the Word of God brings blessings, right? So it's, it's worth a few minutes to go through that. Now, if you did that, if you put in water in the concordance, or you flip to that page in the printed version, one of the verses that you would find would be Isaiah 57, verse 20. So let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 20. And this verse says this, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Okay, so here's a verse in the Old Testament, obviously different author than the book of Revelation, but they're using the same symbol. Isaiah is using water to symbolize essentially the same thing, but there's a more specific meaning here, right? 
These waters that represent people in prophecy, Isaiah says, specifically represent the world at large, right? Those that are not serving God. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. And so as you connect verse with verse in the Bible, a picture will begin to emerge. And um, especially when you see three or four verses using the same symbol, but with slightly different uh, connotations or views of that subject, you'll get a very clear biblical picture of what that symbol represents. That's a, a great. I'm, I'm glad you remember. You had that in these. You had me to that question, but I didn't get to it. I think that's, that's really one of the reasons that coming to every night is really a powerful experience. You have a, a very unique opportunity to be bathed in, in Scripture.